I should say that this the talk has a subtitle, which is how I learned to love the flood. Because as you'll see, the imagery of, of the flood and Noah's Ark is very central to a lot of the topics that we've been uh, discussing so far. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a particular pleasure to be speaking at this point in the conference when so many of the themes that I'm going to be treating have already been touched on. So I do feel that I'm fit fitting right into the, the flood of knowledge that's been unleashed. It was an ancient method of teaching the mysteries to present fragments of information, not necessarily in the right order, not necessarily in a way that you would appreciate at first listening, to overcome the obstacles in the environment to so the reception of that knowledge was a part of the initiatory way. So in the time available, I can only really give you the building materials uh, and a sketch of the plan of the work. It's for you to create your blueprints and to discover how to work the stone, to be both the architect and the master builder. Um, and to do this, we're going to work with some very powerful, and beautiful images from the Hermetic tradition. In the Western culture, um, words and ideas are often regarded as primary information. Um, but in the mysteries, in the magical traditions, the image, the imagination, often regarded as more important than what the logical mind can decode of them and put into ordinary words. So in many ways, this talks um, some reflections on a collection of key images put together by past students of the eternal knowledge, our counterparts 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Um, and by doing that, we really take our place in the river of the recovery of the tradition. So um, we've already um, had some audience feedback. This is indeed the, an image of the Temple of Solomon, which became in the, in the Jewish and then the Christian tradition a great symbol of how high cultural products can be destroyed, can be lost, but if the knowledge of its design, its proportions, and what it meant and was for is preserved, it can be rebuilt. It can be regenerated. Um, there's an, an endless symbolism in, in the idea of a, of a temple, a ruined temple, um, still speaks of what it was for and what, it, and what is meant to be. Um, Freemasonry speaks of the lost word. Christianity speaks of the word that was made flesh. But St. John says, the world, through whom, and everything in the world is made through the word, the world didn't know the word when, when the word came in full power. Uh, there's a deep irony in here. The, uh, the Greek philosophers, perhaps a little bit more helpfully, spoke of, of the body as being the, the temple of the soul, the temple of the spirit, or the tomb. So there was, a, there was a pun the Greek philosophers used to use, which was the soma, the body. There's also a sema, i.e. a tomb or temple. And um, that really opens the game wide open because, well, for, we know this really, but you, the, you know, this is the meaning of life. So let's, at this time in the day, useful to remember the, you know, how we came to be here and, and you know, the, the essence of our existence. It's very simple. The old story goes something like this. In the beginning, in the timeless beginning, the one reality is, we can't really say was, and the one reality wanted there to be existence. God doesn't exist, didn't exist. So if an atheist tells you God doesn't exist, you're on firm grounds of agreeing wholeheartedly. God doesn't exist, God is. But God wanted existence to be. But all there was was God. So God poured forth or allowed there to be existence. And this was matter. This was all of the potential of what could be from the, from the most from a stone to an archangel to a galaxy. All this came into being through the one reality making matter. Now this, in a sense, was a sacrifice. Um, really, Christianity speaks of the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. You get the same idea in, in Vedic teachings like we heard yesterday, that the Purusha was sacrificed. You get similar ideas in Norse mythology that all it is came into being through the sacrifice of the original oneness that poured out its light into the matter it had made. And in, in simple terms, this means 
you make your bed and you have to lie in it. The one being wanted there to be world. And what that meant was suffering. Crucifixion is the correct term um, in, in Christian mysticism. And yet, from that death, from that entrapment in matter, the conditions we created, comes resurrection. Um, like, a, like the shell that remains when, when the snail has gone, you could say that matter shows the spirit that formed it and that gets trapped in it and can then be released when the form dies. And a new form will be built. You can see it in reincarnation. You can see it in the changing of epochs. Um, this primal symbolism um, of form and matter is um, what this symbol of Solomon's temple is really all about. Um, and perhaps the second point to make about that is what is true of the whole universe is also true of the human body and it's also true of a temple or tomb and it's also true of language or a letter. So anything I'm saying about words is also true of the body is also true of the universe. Useful to bear in mind. So, all right, the ancient wisdom. Well, what is it? It's very hard to get a concise description of the wisdom, one of the reasons being that most students who studied it in depth swore oaths of secrecy about it in, in our traditions. So here's a, a quote I picked almost at random from Cicero, the philosopher and politician who was also an initiate. Um, I shall say nothing of that sacred and august Eleusinia, into whose mysteries the most distant nations were initiated, nor of the solemnities in Samothrace or in Lemnos, secretly resorted to by night and surrounded by thick and shady groves, which, if they were properly explained and reduced to reasonable principles, would rather explain the nature of things than discover the knowledge of gods. Now, that does, that does make the important point that if you were a student of the mysteries, then as now, you weren't just told the old stories about the gods and the myths, you were taught science, you were taught philosophy. Um, it does slight create the, the false idea that the mysteries were a proto-science which dispensed with religion. No, much, much more correct to say the mysteries had a unified view of life which explained religion, science, art, and everything in, in one ageless and eternal truth. Now, this, this is a famous illustration from Robert Flood's um, uh, famous Utrius um, Cosmoque. Um, it's called the Divine Monochord. And it obviously shows very clearly the view of the cosmos as, as a oneness from the heights, the, the highest harmonies, if you like, to the depths. So you can see the, at the bottom the four elements, and then you have the planets, and then you have the, the realms beyond the planetary. Now, some of you may have been asking yourself this weekend, I know I have, why should I believe in the ancient wisdom? The, uh, these are beautiful ideas, but I need, need more conviction. Um, one beginning is that it, the ancient wisdom is like the trunk from which all other sciences you could imagine um, branch out. If the, if the ancient wisdom, the unifying truths, were not true, everything else we believe would fall apart. Um, and the great symbol of the teacher of that unified truth was Hermes Trismegistus. I saw a wonderful image in the last presentation of Hermes with this similar um, hat like that on. You see him with his, his normal iconography. He's got the little model of the world. See, Hermes is said to have a threefold knowledge of, of the cosmos. There's the um, double serpented caduceus. There's the, the Greek name for God, Theos, in the top. And one early modern scientist philosopher um, who had a very deep understanding of Hermes and Hermeticism was Francis Bacon. Not Roger Bacon, who we were hearing about before, but, but Francis Bacon. Um, he wrote a wonderful argument for science and learning to King James, and his, his praise, his flattery of James, he was trying to get James to invest a lot of money into universities and science so that what we know of science could come about. Didn't quite happen in James's reign. His plan was picked up in, in, the, in Charles II's reign and became um, the Royal Society. Um, but the foundations were laid in 1605 by Francis Bacon in, in this book, really. And he said, there has met in your majesty a rare conjunction as well of divine and sacred literature 
as a profane and human. This is a little hermetic pun. There'd been a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn when, around the time these words were written, representing the, the divine and, and the, um, the human powers. So this was a sort of hermetic in-joke that was known in the circle. Um, so as your majesty standeth invested of that triplicity which in great veneration was ascribed to the ancient Hermes, the power and fortune of a king, the knowledge and illumination of a priest, and the learning and universality of a philosopher. So they have the, the three realms of the universe of which Hermes or a hermeticist is master. The philosopher who, who understands nature, the king who is a master of the human realm, and the priest who makes the connection to the divine. So uh, you, there are, there's years of meditation in, in this paragraph of Bacon. So another wonderful illustration from Flood of the the harmonic worldview of the hermeticists at, it's still persisting in the early 17th century. You can see there's God at the top and then the divine mind, then the, um, the angelic hierarchies and then the planets and then the four elements and Earth at the center in, in that way of seeing the universe. Um, but it's quite useful, I think, because we were hearing in the last talk about you know, alchemy and science and how alchemy seemed to fade and science arises, but actually science owes many of its best insights to alchemy. But there was a sense at the time that some of the wisdom was being lost, and at such times nostalgia often arises. So to reflect that you know, even in a Greek times, Hermes was a nostalgic figure. They were looking back to the, the fullness of the ancient wisdom, maybe not 432,000 years before or, or whatever, but, but many thousands of years before there had been a unified wisdom. And even in Greek times, the Egyptians felt it was being lost. They saw this rise in Greek culture. They said, this is a childish and, and rather um, superficial culture. Um, famous quote of an Egyptian priest to the Greek sage Solon, you Greeks have always been children without knowledge of antiquity or antiquity of knowledge. Of course, the Egyptian civilization persisted for thousands of years. They had a right to that, uh, to that uh, <laughs> snobbery, really. But um, at certain times in history, a certain key problem arises. And the wisdom, was, whether it was in Egypt or Babylon or Sumer, was local. So people had wisdom associated, associated with their mystery schools, their gods. But their gods were not the same gods as each other. So how could they find one truth? How could they find an eternal wisdom? Um, and this, this became a kind of riddle, which this, the wisdom teachers of Alexandria attempted to solve. And in many respects, what we call the Christian religion is the outer showing forth of the, the mystery traditions of the time that were looking to find one truth and which, in, to some minds, had to be represented by one God. So it's not coincidental at the same time that the Christians say the Son of God came on earth, the, Romans, the Roman emperors put, were setting themselves up as the Son of God. Um, I suppose the final follow-on from, from this tension between spiritual traditions and the challenge to them came with the rise of science. Back, back in Greek times, you'd have the tension between divine and human. Now in the scientific age, you have the tension between the whole spiritual traditions and materialism. And a movement arose which set itself up to try and heal that split. And that's really what Rosicrucianism was all about. So the Invisible College, famous portrayal of the Rosicrucian movement. This, this illustration is found in a book called Speculum Sophocum Rhodostauroticum which basically means um, mirror of the wisdom of the Rosicrucians. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hilarious picture, really, which illustrates the idea that, you know, who are the Rosicrucians? Do they really exist? They're on the move. They're almost like a conspiracy or like gypsies. You never know when they're in town. They, they move through cultures and societies. Um, you can see up in the sky above, above the, the moving castle, there's the, ser the serpent bearer, Serpentarius, and the swan, Cygnus. There'd been supernovas in both those constellations in the decades before the Rosicrucian movement. So this was really saying, even the stars are saying a new age is dawning, and, and we are a sign of that. Beautiful emblem, that rosa mel apibus, the rose gives 
honey to the bees. Who were the bees? The bees were the initiates or the students of, of Rosicrucianism. A very inspiring seminal figure to the, the pre-Rosicrucian movement, John Dee, looking a bit grumpier than he often does. Um, now, one thing that's often forgotten about the wisdom in the early 17th century is that it was really associated with religion. Um, this is Martin Luther's personal seal, and you'll see that it is actually a rose cross. So he's got the rose and the, and the crucifix in the middle. This is um, not coincidental, because Martin Luther had an amazing idea. He, he was asking himself, why... Is, why is Catholicism, why is Christendom falling apart? Which was the perception of, um, of his understanding of the, the vice that the church seemed to be falling into. And the idea he came up with was theology is, is pagan. That the ideas and the logic that church theology is couched in comes from Aristotle, comes from the Greeks. And this isn't the wisdom. This isn't the primitive um, dispensation of Jesus and the apostles certainly not, not the ancient wisdom. So he said, let's throw away all of Greek knowledge. And Francis Bacon, the philosopher, and indeed the Rosicrucians, applied the same idea to science. They said, and Paracelsus indeed had had a similar idea. Just like religion went wrong, because people swapped spiritual truth for human ideas, the same happened with the sciences. We lost the ancient Egyptian wisdom, the perennial wisdom for Greek and humanistic um, d doings of the human mind. So here we are at the three or four hundred years into the recovery, I suppose, of, of the ancient knowledge. This is an illustration I, I borrowed from a wonderful book by Robin Heath, Sun, Moon and Stonehenge. Um, just a, a taster of the way in which ancient knowledge was, was preserved through very simple means, simple mathematics, but um, was very precise. Um, Iamblichus, the Greek philosopher speaking about Hermes, said that Hermes wrote the scheme of the cosmos in 36,525 books. Now, if you put the decimal point in, you'll see that's 365.25, which is a very accurate assessment of the length of the solar year. Um, if you go back into the ancient texts, you'll see many examples of precise astronomical knowledge coded into, into myth sometimes. Um, so this, you know, I, I come to a similar diagram from my study of 17th century texts. So I was fascinated to find this in Robin Heath's book, that you've, you'll be well aware of Pythagoras's theorem and that there are certain whole number ratios. So this is the big triangle is the 5, 12, 13 triangle. Um, and the smaller triangle is, is really um, 3, 12, 12.369. 12 and that number 12.369 is the square root of 153, which is a, a mystical number you'll find in the gospel and in ancient Greek mathematics. And the joy of this is that it was a practical tool, and Heath shows this quite clearly, that because there are 12.369 very closely lunations in a year, the number of moon cycles in a, in a solar year, you can map from between the, the number of months, solar months and lunar months, very exactly. And you can use a simple triangle, 5, 12, 13 triangle, as a calculator, as an astronomical calculator. And he, he reconstructed a primitive megalithic computer, which works with a fair degree of accuracy by using such simple tools. Now, I'd say this is really just the tip of the iceberg of what was known at the time. Just a page from Cornelius Agrippa's books of um, occult philosophy, um, really showing the, the very traditional Kabbalistic view of, of how the universe is constructed. There are different worlds. Um, at the beginning, the original world, the world of names and of letters and language. So you see the, in, in Hebrew letters the name, different names of, of God. They're, in fact, the titles of the Sephiroth of the Tree of Life. And then below it, the spiritual hierarchies, the different elemental spheres, and the different kind of animals found below. So as above, so below, the, uh, the archetypes of all that is are letters, really. So if you knew what a letter was or a hieroglyph, you would have the primal codes which would explain everything you see around you in the physical world. 
language or the word is the key to the universe. So without further ado, let's dip into some pictorial representations of the ancient wisdom in action. This is a, a scene that was referred to earlier of Moses uh, in the desert. The um, Israelites have been afflicted by a disease, which is called the fiery serpents. They're, they're perishing of, of this, this venomous disease. And Moses heals them by erecting a serpent on a pole. It's known as the brazen serpent. Um, and it's almost the homeopathic principle that if you've been afflicted by, by snake bite, snake bite can cure you. But there's a lot more to it than that. In particular, it shows Moses' deep connection to the Egyptian wisdom. It says in the Bible that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, um, which is <clears throat> was shown in his ability to beat the um, pharaoh's priests in, a, in competitive snake magic, but that's another story. But the, the, the point to notice the pole is a, is a tau, um, which is the most primitive form of the cross, and more to be said. It, as I said, this is analogous to the Asclepius serpent, but it's a very, a very um, persistent image, the serpent rising on the pole or the towel pole. Um, and you'll see on the right, this is a, like a, a trowel or spade, and the serpent is, is crowned. So this is really a, a reference to the, the evolution from matter, from the chaotic forces to a state of illumination and, and perfection, as shown by the, uh, the crown. Now, the Tao became a very important symbol in, in Freemasonry, particularly in the form of the Triple Tau. The phrase uh, Triple Tau really only became published a couple of hundred years ago, but clues to it were being leaked in 17th century books long before the Masonic connotations of it were known, uh, particularly in the, the, those who took Francis Bacon's work forward. They didn't say what it meant openly, but they gave enough clues in their works to show. There are many meanings to the triple tau. It can mean the, th the three direction, the three directions the sun can be seen in, the east, south, and the west, and there's the hidden fourth, the north. It can refer to the three crosses on Golgotha, Jesus and the two criminals that surrounded him. So, go back to Francis Bacon, who's been a great inspiration to me in this. He was really the one person who came up with the idea that we needed science, and the aim of science was to retrieve the eternal knowledge, the ancient wisdom. And the name he gave to it was the great instauration. Now, literally, you know, restoration is the normal translation of it, but you'll see there's tau in there and stauros, and that's, that's not an arbitrary um, pun, because the stauros, the pole, um, was, was explained as being such through the tower. I think now we'll, we'll move on from that because we started late. Um, so here is a representation of the Kabbalistic tree of life, two images from it, the, the lightning flash on the left descending and the serpent arising. Again, you can see the same principle of the tower and the serpent rising on it. This serpent in Kabbalah is called uh, Nekwistan, um, which is essentially from the same linguistic root as the Naga um, in, in Indian teachings, the, the serpent power or Kundalini that rises. So we're starting to get some clues to the shape, the T or the Tau, can be understood from a spiritual perspective. Um, and also, a number. The Tau in Greek and in, in the Elizabethan English of the English Rosicrucians like Francis Bacon was the 19th letter of the alphabet and therein hangs a tail. Um, so as I studied this deeper I thought where will I look for confirmation that there is symbolism in numbers and letters as used in the tradition. And strangely enough there turn out to be many clues once you start to look. One is chapter and verse in the Bible. Um, another one is, is lists given in, in works which have unnecessarily precise numbering or categorization. I'll give you some examples of that later. So John's Gospel um, was where I started. 
The 19th chapter of John's Gospel is the chapter that describes the crucifixion of Jesus. And 19th letter tau is the letter cross. The tau literally means cross. So I thought, well, this is rather remarkable. The, le the letter tau is the crucifix, and the 19th chapter tau was the, the book in John's Gospel that described the crucifixion. And I thought, well, we've already seen how the symbolism is that the spirit being crucified or sacrificed on the body, which is the tau, is the primal mystery. So the body is the sacrifice, is the sign. So rather remarkably, you'll remember that Pontius Pilate um, ordered that a sign be put above Jesus' head on the crucifix, which said, Inri, Jesus Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now that sign of the sign that Jesus was, was chapter 19, verse 19. And the more, you, the more that you go into it, the more that you see that the ancient record keepers encoded very specific knowledge into the scriptures. They're not accidental. I'm skipping on. So I'd just like to show you a, a diagram which really opened up my understanding of, of sacred number. This will make more sense when I've read this. This is a, a passage from Bacon's New Atlantis. New Atlantis starts with floods, a tempest, which is really described as being an initiation, somewhat worse than we're having now. Um, the, they're on a boat that leaves Peru, they get washed around in the seas and pitch up on an island, a magical island called Ben Salem. This is one of the first things that happens when they reach this, this island of sages. They get taken to a, a kind of quarantine house, the stranger's house. The stranger's house is a fair and spacious house, built of brick, of somewhat bluer colour than our brick. Some windows, some of glass, some of cambric oiled. He brought us first into a fair parlour above stairs, and then he asked us, what number of persons were we, and how many sick? And we answered, we were sick and whole, one and fifty persons, whereof our sick were seventeen. Okay, that's strange. Fifty-one is um, seven times three, so exactly a third of the ship had been sick, exactly two-thirds were well. Right. He desired us to have patience a little and stay till he came back to us. Then he led us to the chambers which were provided for us, being in number nineteen, they having cast it as it seemeth, the four of those chambers, which were better than the rest, might receive four of the principal men, and so on and so forth. And it, modern academics ignore these numbers, but many of the 17th century works are full of, of these rather arch and cryptic use of, of unnecessarily precise numbers. And this is just a clue. I actually think this, this passage contains a system of cryptography, but it was just to show how the numbers that are generated by it um, serve as symbolic clues. If you've gone into the symbolism of Freemasonry, you'll notice that almost every number listed in the categorization of the sick bay described by Bacon um, refers to, to a, a key number in Masonic symbolism. But this was just to show that having found that 19 was important, 17 is as well. Why? Well, this brings us back to our letters again, to our ABCs. Um, the Latin name for your ABCs was the Abecedarium. Um, in English, it was called the Absi Book, and, and for generations, we learned our letters with something like this. Um, there are many references in Shakespeare to it. Um, the, you can see B on the one on the right, B is for bear, C is for cat, T is for Turk. And this idea of an Abecedarium, that a letter stood a word is of course deeply cabalistic because we said the primal archetypes of all that is are letters and things that exist in the world. So it's it's a kid's it's a, a child's diagram, but also the Rosicrucians a similar method for encoding conceptual letters. So the name for the Abbasidarium or Absi book was the cross row. No, that was the, 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 uh, the standard name, the cross row. Now, in the Elizabethan cross row, the 17th letter was, was R, just as it is in Greek, the 17th letter was rho. So we've already said the 19th letter was, was cross or tau. So why is France Spain such a fan of the number 17 and 19? Because you've got the, the rho or rose and the cross. 17 and 19 are rose cross. So you'll, you'll find these little punning remarks on cross rows, rose cross in the old books. And, and the, 
they were meant to make the search for knowledge entertaining as you, as you, as you tunneled away and, and saw the connections. So, this is a rendition of um, what in Masonic symbolism is called the Royal Arch. You'll see the, um, the rainbow underneath the, the jewel on the right. And perhaps now it's worth reflecting on, on number in scripture because I don't know how many of you have, have studied Old, Old Testament number. I had no interest in it before I started this work. But um, a re remarkable number of events in Jewish history happened on the 17th day of the month, specifically on the 17th day of the month Nisan. Noah's flood started on the 17th of a month. It lasted five months or 150 days, and it finished on the 17th of the month Nisan. Now, many years later, on the same day of the month, the Hebrews entered Egypt. Again, on the 17th of Nisan, they departed from Egypt. Um, so the Egyptians parted, and the, the Israelites passed through, and the pursuers were drowned. And so you see, just as with Noah's flood, bad world, almost all the world apart from Noah, the, his family and the animals were washed away and drowned, but the faithful remnant survived. The same thing happened on the anniversary many years later of, um, of Moses and the Israelites fleeing, you know, preserved miraculously to start a new civilization. Now many other events happened on the same date, but the most famous one was that Jesus' resurrection also occurred on the 17th of Nisan. Um, so yet again, you be surprised in the Gospels when you hear this language of deliverance, a new dispensation has come about because it happened on the anniversary of all these archetypal events of deliverance through flood. Another thing that had happened on the 17th of Nisan was the, the, the uh, chosen people had tasted the first fruits in the Promised Land for the first time. So don't be surprised when you hear about St. Paul saying, Jesus was a kind of first fruits of, of the new world, the new dispensation. These aren't just pious phrases. They relate to actual chronological mysticism that is sitting there in the Gospels and the, and the Torah, but normally neglected. Now, it's very in interesting to try and work out why 17 should have been an interesting number. With, with 19, it was clear I um, had to pass over that the number 19 is the key to you can still see if you're working out the date of Easter in the, in the Book of Common Prayer, for example, that the sun and the moon operate on a 19-year cycle, and technically the metonic cycle, that the, the, the phase of the sun and the moon takes 19 years to come back round for thousands of years. But there was nothing analogous to that with the number 17. The only thing I could find was that Osiris was to have died the 17th day of the month, and his death had been you know, honoured with barge processions on the Nile, and he again was reborn on the day, as, as Jesus was later said to have been. So again, there's water, there's death and resurrection to do with the date 17th. I suspect that the Jews preserved this as a folk memory from their time in Egypt, and even when they um, no longer remembered why they celebrated on that day, they continue to. But I think there was a, an actual mathematical reason, and I think the Egyptians knew it, but more about that anon. So to summarize these polarities, these numbers 17 and 19, these letters R and T, it really fits very neatly into the, the principles of sulfur and mercury that, that we heard about in the last talk. You've got the ark and the crucifix, the dove, because when the rainbow came out after the flood, you had the dove. Or the dove and the serpent. Jesus said we've got to be innocent as doves and wise as serpents. You've got the rose for R and the cross for tau. Even, rather intriguingly, lots of symbolism around these numbers in the text has the head for the number 17. And Orpheus, the, the great image of Orpheus when his, his head was severed, and it still it floats down the river, um, still singing, still prophesying, till it was planted on Lesbos, which is why the great poets like Sappho came from Lesbos. Um, but intriguingly, 19 associated with the, the bodiless head. Do you think 
ancient pyramid symbolism that the bodiless if the pyramid or the temple is your body, then the pyramid lacking its capstone, all that science can do without God is, is the pyramid, but the capstone or the head is, is what the spirits can put on top. Symbolized in a, a classic title piece in Francis Bacon's work of, of the Instauratio Magna, um, the two pillars and the boat sailing beyond them to the New World. This was very live in, in, in the 16th and 17th century because the New World had been discovered. The, the, these idea of the Kabbalistic pillars, well, they were sometimes called the Pillars of Hercules, which, of course, were the Straits of Gibraltar. The old idea was there's nothing beyond, known plus ultra. Well, the New World showed there was more beyond, and there's a spiritual world beyond, and if you go through the polarities, sailing, born through the tempest, then we can reach that new spiritual That was some basic hope. Right, I'm just going to skip on. Okay. Just a, a, a couple more numerical clues to show how, how we were taught um, cryptic arithmetic in the old days. The life story of, of Christian Rosenkreutz, the mythical founder of Rosicrucianism. Um, he was said to have been born in 1378 and to have lived till 1484, a wonderful lifespan of 106 years. Now, both 1378 and 1484 are divisible by the number 106. It was very, very polite of him to live his life on mathematical principles. And in fact, you can, you can calculate it in various ways that 53 times 26 was when he was born and 53 times 26 was when he died. Now, again, this may be pure allegory or maybe he really did live in this math mathematical way. But um, just as the number 153, which you referred to earlier, is a triangular number, you could do it as a, as a tetractus or a pyramid, so is 1378. So Christian Rosenkreuz was a pyramid of 52 layers. Appropriate. Now, another number that was used by the Rosicrucians in this cryptic way was... Now, you, they, they like to pull your leg, and here, here's an example of the way that they did. You'll find a line that they, they give 37 reasons why they are releasing Rosicrucianism at this time. Now, there are no 37 reasons. You can look in the book in vain for them. Um, this kind of thing was used frequently at the time to wake you up and say, why have they said 37? Okay, it's not literal. It's meant to focus your attention on the number. Well... The numbers 53 and 37 were very important in the Hermetic tradition. And you can find in the right of Plutarch why that was. Because, strange as it may seem to those of you that didn't enjoy mathematics at school, the right-angled triangle, the Pythagorean triangle, was a religious sign. Osiris was associated with the, the length of three, which was vertical. Isis with the length of four, which was horizontal. And their child, Horus, was the hypotenuse. And the angles rounded to the nearest number of, of the Osiris Horus angle of 53 and of Isis 37. So don't be surprised many times when you find the numbers 53 and 37 in the old texts. It's a reference to the Egyptian vision of the Trinity. Now, those of you that have studied Gematria will know that 37 is a wonderful number because it's the root of a lot of special numbers, um, such as 666, which is not an evil number, um, it, it's the number of the sun. 777 is the cross, 888 is Jesus in, in Greek gematria, which we don't have time to go in. So, gematria, it can be interesting, but you, you need independent corroborations from different traditions. So, in terms of the number 53, um, 53 is the, in... Hebrew gematria, the num is the value for arban, which means stone. Now, ben is sun, so 52 is, is the sun, and if you add aleph to the sun, you have the stone, and ab is far. So this, this was a, a sort of numerological game or insight that the stone is where the father and the sun meet. So if you think you have the father as the originating principle of the sky and the sun as the, the realization on earth, the stone is the symbol for that union, and that's what the number 53 means. And that is the connotation of that number repeatedly in the text of the time. Um, another piece of biblical exegesis, 37, the other angle, 
is the value in Gematria of Yekidah, which is the highest spiritual principle in Kabbalah. And it's also the value of the name Abel. So when you hear in the old authors that Abel, the, the, the good son who was slain by Cain, was like the origin of Christ, it's not, again, not just pious, because Jesus is the value 888, and the lowest residual multiple is, is Abel. This is how they thought. Now, I think that we're on our way to understanding what the spiritual meaning of number really is, and it will come through new physics, through, through new discoveries in mathematics. Um, these are two diagrams I've taken from Vernon Watkins, a very interesting biblical researcher who wrote the other Bible code. Um, and he showed how a lot of the key words in scriptural passages have certain values that can be rendered as beautiful patterns. Um, the, you can see on the, the star, the star of David on the, on the right, that this is a star of 37, that number again with a heart of 19, um, two of the key numbers in, in Greek and Hebrew gematria. And I think it's not too much to expect that as physics goes on, it will start to find these mysterious numbers that we've known about from the wisdom actually encoded in the, in the depths of material structure. This is a... Okay, five minutes. So... To return to, to Francis Bacon, this, this was the way he described what science ought to be. And I think science hasn't really risen to the challenge of that yet. He said knowledge is like a pyramid. It needs a firm base in experimental science, natural history. And then you do physics, which is what he called material and efficient causes. That's old-fashioned language for what we call science. If A, then B. If, if I heat something to a certain temperature, then B happens. And he was all in favor of that. His criticism of the old metaphysics was that, that metaphysicians wanted to fly from the base to the top without doing research in physics. You do the research, but then you go to metaphysics, formal causes and final causes. You know, it's not enough to understand how to, um, how to make gold, even for an alchemist. You have to understand what gold is, and that is to understand the essences of things. Um, and... He, left, he, said you shouldn't, he said, in effect, you shouldn't put the capstone on this pyramid. We have no idea whether science will teach us God's law, the one unifying law of nature, but we can know it's there. It can't be, the capstone can't be put on from below, but it can certainly be brought down from above. Um, another image he used classically in the Kabbalistic and Hermetic tradition was he said we need ladders, ladders of intellect to ascend and descend. And his view of science was you do research and physics, and then you go to metaphysics, and then you check it by coming back down to physics. You're ascending and descending Jacob's Ladder, as it was called traditionally. It's a wonderful vision that, on the one hand, you had the wisdom teachers, the Rosicrucians, and on the other hand, you had the scientists trying to build a bridge to it. And I don't think that bridge was built at the time. I still don't think it's been built. Events like this are a harbinger at the time is a way when that bridge will be built. Um, so just to finish again with an image of Royal Arch. The capstone missing there that needs to be replaced. This is the, you can see the rendition of, of Hiram, Hiram of Tyre, and also the reference to Hiram Abbott, who was slain. Um, I think for time reasons I'm going to have to leave that. Um, so I'm going to finish with an inspiring image of the, of the same passage through the Pillars of Hercules um, that, we, that we saw earlier. The polarity, the alchemical polarity between the sulfur and the mercury, between life and death, all these oppositions. We mustn't avoid them, as we were told in the last talk. We must stand in the polarity and move through it to the new world. We must, in, in respect of our current situation, we have religion or moral issues, science or technical issues. We mustn't shirk the battle. And there's one problem that's often found in eternal knowledge, that we, we develop a culture of our own with information and ideas we like. But does it really work? Is it scientific? And does it really elevate us and make the world a better place? Is it religious? But if, if it meets both those challenges and can sail through it, then we are on our way to the, to the new Atlantis, to the new world. So. Having made our way through the flood, I think that's a good place to end. Thank you very much.